Okay, well, it's a pleasure to have Professor Zyberg uh, give us a third lecture. And as I mentioned already, we will have q and in, in the 4 p.m. slot after that in Bloomberg Hall. Regarding Q&A, you should view the whole two weeks is a big Q&A session. Whenever you grab me, some of you did that, others did less of it. Uh, I heard lots of questions, both uh, when we had this meeting in, in Bloomberg Hall and also through the week. Uh, many people came with questions and based on that, I adjusted my lectures, especially this one, which is completely different than what I originally planned. So, Instead of starting by asking if there are any questions about the previous lectures, I'm going to review very rapidly uh, the previous talk. And recall that we had eight examples demonstrating various features. Uh, for lack of time, I presented only seven of them, but this time I'll do all eight. So example one was three plus one D U1 gauge theory. Example two, or maybe I should review that here we had U1, one form electric symmetry. And the same thing with magnetic symmetry. One of them can be thought of as a center symmetry because it's associated with the center of U1. The other one is no connection to the center of anything unless we perform a duality transformation. And toward the end of the uh, talk, I will give a whole summary of global versus local symmetries, global versus gate symmetries, and kind of to put all the pieces that appeared here and there in the talks together. But already here we see that the way we present the theory, electric and magnetic degrees of freedom appear asymmetrically, even though the theory has complete symmetry between electric and magnetic symmetries. Example two was in two plus one dimension. And that was U1 level N. And this is a churn simons theory. And it had a Zn one form electric symmetry, but you can also think of it as magnetic symmetry. But there's only one of them. And you can say that it came from the center of the group. Example three, which I skipped yesterday was D plus one dimensional gauge theory, TQFT. This is also a TQFT. With the Lagrangian is N over two pi, ADB. And this turns out to be equivalent to a ZN gauge theory. And since we are in D plus one dimensions, a is a one form and B is a D minus one form. And correspondingly, we have ZN electric symmetry, which is one form and ZN magnetic symmetry, which is D minus one form. And the operators that implement them are e to the i corner integral of b, and this is e to the i corner integral of a. So let me explain where, how it comes about. Just by looking at the Lagrangian, it's clear that a and b are canonically conjugate to each other, or if you wish the propagator connects a to b, not a to a and b to b. And therefore, when we act with e to the i integral of b, we shift A, and when we act with E to the I integral of A, we shift B. And this integral is along a one cycle, and this is along a D minus one cycle, and hence the degrees of the form. So this is example three. 
example four was somewhat more interesting. So these two are free field, these three examples are free field theories. So they are exactly solvable. Example four was a little bit more interesting. It was three plus one D U1 gauge theory with scalars with charge N. And the observables are Wilson lines with charge N and the truth lines also on the line with charge M. So these are dions. And we still have the magnetic, so it's one form U1 magnetic symmetry. And therefore M could be an arbitrary integer, but because the scalars with charge N can screen the Wilson line, the one form electric symmetry is only Zn. So that was an example four. And number example five is related more closely to what we study in this school. It's three plus one dimensional SUN. And now we have a Zn electric one form symmetry. Symmetry. And we said that there's no magnetic symmetry and there's an electric symmetry. And then, which is really, is really the topic of this same of this school, is three plus one the SUN gauge theory with quarks in the n-dimensional representation. And then there is no higher form symmetry. No symmetry at all, actually. No internal symmetry. So this was example six. And example seven was three plus one D PSUN. Here we cannot add quarks in the fundamental. And we also don't have the electric symmetry that we had here because we gauged it. But instead we have a Zn one form symmetry. Symmetry, which is magnetic. And it can be not be thought of as having anything to do with the center of the group. So it should not be called the center symmetry. An example eight, which is perhaps of a difficult, totally different flavor, and no pun intended here, was the CPN sigma model. So for example, for n equals one, it's the O3 sigma model. It has an SUN ordinary global symmetry. Zero form symmetry, form symmetry which is the isometry of CPN. And then depending on the dimensions, it also has a higher form symmetry in, in two plus one dimension, we have a zero form magnetic symmetry. We can call it magnetic. In three plus one, we have a one form symmetry. Let's not call it magnetic, just call it like that. It comes from wrapping the space, two, dimension, no, two dimensions of space, wrapping it around a non-trivial cycle in CPN. So the CPN model in one plus one dimension has instantons. These configurations are solitons in two plus one dimensions. They're particles and they are usually referred to as skirmion for various reasons. And in three plus one dimensions, there are strings and therefore there's a one form symmetry. And if we study the same model in four plus one dimensions, there are membranes and there's a two form global symmetry. This has nothing to do with the, this has nothing to do with the center of anything because there is no gauge group. There's another presentation of the theory with gauge fields, but that's not the one we are using here. And even then these are not associated with the center. So this symmetry should not be called a center symmetry. So that was the first part of 
yesterday's talk. And then that was kind of kinematics. Kinematics means we specify the Lagrangian, we identify the symmetries. And now we have to study the dynamics and ask what are the consequences? So I mentioned without proof and also without giving any example that if we have two dual presentations of the same theory, one of them is one of these or anything else. And another one is also perhaps one of these. If the two are dual, they should better have the same global symmetry. And then we should check whether these symmetries match. This is a powerful tool on conjecture dualities and miraculously all the interesting examples pass this test in a highly non-trivial way. Question. I was actually imprecise, it should be PSUN. Thank you for correcting me. Is that what bothered you? Yeah, thank you. It means that you, at least one person paid attention in my first talk. I'll use another color to point my mistake. Does this answer your question? N plus one, ah, okay, it's even worse. Now it's correct? Good, thank you. I'm giving no, in fact, I'm giving a guarantee that there will be additional mistakes on the blackboard. There is no way to give a talk without mistakes. That's one of the rules of nature, yes. Ah, excellent question. So electric, we can obviously think about it that way because uh, it shifts the gauge field, but magnetic is a little bit more interesting. You can ask, what do we mean by magnetic symmetry in two plus one dimension? And what it means is that if we have a line, there could be another line that goes around it that measures the holonomy of the line. And in a U1 gauge theory with level N, if we take, take charge K, Wilson line with charge K, it creates holonomy, which is K over N. But it, it, you see in the ZN version, which was the example I skipped yesterday, here, we do it in two plus one dimensions. We do it separately for A and separately for B. So the electric of A can be thought of as magnetic for B and the electric for B can be thought of as magnetic for A. When A equals B, they're both electric and magnetic. So what can we do with the symmetry? The first thing we could do is try to put the system in a non-trivial background field for the symmetry. So we have a symmetry. We can couple the system to a background gauge field for that symmetry. And that amounts to placing the system in a box with twisted boundary conditions. I don't know if you, in any of the speakers, describe the Atuf twisted boundary conditions here. Is any speaker? You did, great. So the Atuf twisted boundary condition is not a property of PSUN gauge theory, nor is it a property of the theory with quarks. With quarks, we cannot use the twisted boundary condition. Instead, this is a property of the SUN theory which has a one form symmetry. And if we turn on background field for the one form symmetry, that corresponds to studying the twisted boundary conditions. We do not sum over the twisted boundary conditions. If we sum over the twisted boundary conditions, that would be the PSUN theory. If we don't sum over the boundary condition, this is an observable of the SUN theory. And you'll be surprised the level of confusion that exists in the literature about this particular point. You correct me again, probably. Yes. Yes. 
Right. Also, if you have flavor, you can mix this symmetry with a twist of flavor and have more, uh, more twists. Uh, I would like to think of them as twists of flavor, which allows, which force me to perform the, follow, the same twist. But if I just to twist, want to twist only with the one form symmetry, then what I said is correct. Okay. And then once we twist, we have various twisted boundary conditions. And then we can say, let's gauge the symmetry. Gauging means that we sum over all these twisted boundary conditions. And that might or might not be consistent depending on whether we have anomalies. We had example of that. And as we do that, we can also sum over the various twisted sectors with various phases. That's known as theta parameters. And in, some of you might be familiar with that in two dimensions when you study Oberfolds, and there it is known as discrete torsion. So it's the same phenomenon of discrete torsion. Okay, now we come to the really interesting thing of the dynamics. So far, we just discussed the Lagrangian. There was no dynamics. We can say the discussion so far has been only about the kinematics. And now we come to the dynamics. And again, the same thing you do with ordinary symmetries. You can do it again here. And that symmetry might or might not be spontaneously broken. It might also be spontaneously broken to a subgroup. And if we have mixture of zero form and one form symmetries, like what uh, Mithat brought up, then there could be all sorts of interesting interplay between them for the breaking of the symmetry. But for the simplicity, let us just discuss the higher form symmetry. Let's ignore any possible zero form symmetry and see whether it can be spontaneously broken or not. So the situation is very similar to what we do in ordinary symmetries. And the intuitive way to understand it will relate to meet hot stocks here. Consider the system that has a one form symmetry, for example, SUN gauge theory, compactified on a circle. We no longer have four dimensional Lorentz invariance. We have only three dimensional Lorentz invariance. So whatever was a vector in four dimensions splits into a vector in three dimensions and a scalar. So a one form symmetry in four dimensions splits into a one form symmetry in three dimensions and a zero form symmetry in three dimensions. And any one of them might or might not be spontaneously broken. Could be that both of them are spontaneously broken, another is spontaneously broken, one is and the other is not, etc. But for the zero form symmetry, that's exactly the same as what you have already learned. So a three dimensional person says, yeah, there might be a one form symmetry, but that was only in the advanced class. I had to come to PITP to learn about it. The zero form symmetry is what I learned in my field theory 101. So for the zero form symmetry, it might or might not be spontaneously broken. And for the case of SUN, this was first done by Polyakov. In case you missed him, he was sitting over there in David Gross' talk. And followed by work with, or by Lenny Saskind. And they said that if we consider QCD, the pure gauge theory at finite temperature, this is the same as working on the Euclidean circle of small radius. And when the radius is sufficiently small, which translates to very high temperature. So at very high temperature, the zero form symmetry is spontaneously broken. And at very low temperature, the zero form symmetry is unbroken. And that was used as a way to characterize confinement at finite temperature. And what was used was only the standard things about zero form symmetry, whether the zero form symmetry is spontaneously broken or not. So now we can lift this story to four dimensions. We say the fact that there is a zero form symmetry in three dimensions, which is kind of more conventional, really started its life as a symmetry in four dimensions. Four, I mean three plus one. And that symmetry in three plus one dimension, four dimensions might or might not be spontaneously broken. If it is spontaneously broken, then there is no confinement. If it is not spontaneously broken, then there is confinement. And the statement about finite temperature is about the zero form component of it when we compactify on a circle. So that was kind of a, what was said then. And now I'm saying it more generally, even without a compactification. 
So that for a discrete symmetry, for a continuous symmetry, we can use the same reasoning. Let's compactify on a circle. We know there has to be a Goldstone boson if the symmetry is spontaneously broken, which means that if we didn't compactify on a circle, there must be massless photons, massless gauge fields in the original theory. And indeed, as I said, and I'll soon do in more detail, in example one, the Maxwell theory in four dimensions, the two one form symmetries are spontaneously broken. And the massless photon can be thought of as being massless because it's the Goldstone boson of that symmetry. So everything you know about symmetry, Goldstone theorem, et cetera, you can just copy and do it again. Now, once we are at it with generalities, there are some constraints on symmetry breaking. So for example, can there be symmetry breaking in quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics with a global symmetry. Can there be symmetry breaking? Have you ever discussed symmetry breaking in quantum mechanics? Some people say not, but I don't know whether it means yes or no. So the answer is that in quantum mechanics, there is no symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking is associated with having an infinite number of degrees of freedom with finite number of degrees of freedom which is quantum mechanics and even field theory in finite volume, there is never any symmetry breaking, neither discrete symmetries, nor continuous symmetries. And the reason for that is that in order to have symmetry breaking, you need to freeze some of the fluctuations and you can do that only in infinite volume. In quantum mechanics, you cannot freeze these fluctuations. Now, sorry. Supersymmetry is an exception. I think I said at lecture number one that for any one of the blanket statements I would mean, I would say in the talk, there would be an asterisk with a footnote that it can be extended. And once you extend what you're talking about, the, there are more options that can be used. So supersymmetry can be spontaneously in quantum mechanics. And there are very good reasons for that, which I will be able to, to happy to explain, but it does not fit the general picture that we discuss here. Here, I'm only talking about internal symmetries. We can also discuss time reversal and other symmetries that violate other things I say. Yes. I, it's, some people like to think about this way. I think it's very confusing because symmetry breaking means that the Hilbert space splits to super selection sectors and there is no local operator that takes us from one to the other. That's what symmetry breaking means. So supersymmetry is indeed a counter example. The operator takes us from one to the other is a fermion, but the Hilbert space does not split. So the symmetry is, is broken in, in supersymmetry because the charge does not annihilate the ground state, but we still have, because it's quantum mechanics, this thing that the Hilbert space does not split to super selection sectors. So the proper way to say it is that in quantum mechanics, the Hilbert space does not split to super selection sectors. If it does, you just throw away the other sector and you never discuss it. In field theory or in a field theory in infinite volume, the Hilbert space does split to super selection sectors. Did this, does this answer your question? Good. So in quantum mechanics, there's no symmetry breaking. And using the argument of compactifying on a circle, so we can take a higher form symmetry and compactifying it on circles. And then we learn that a discrete Q form symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken in more than Q plus one dimensions. So basically compactify all the directions that you need. The symmetry has a zero form symmetry that cannot be spontaneously broken. Right? So that's if you need more dimensions for it to spontaneously break. What about continuous symmetries? So continuous symmetries cannot be spontaneously broken in quantum mechanics. Can they be spontaneously broken in one plus one dimensions? Sorry? Yes? So, Continuous symmetries cannot be spontaneously. Discrete, I was saying. Discrete symmetries 
cannot, can be spontaneously broken. The example is say the icing model, but continuous symmetries cannot be broken in quantum mechanics. We need to go at least one dimension higher to break a continuous symmetry. So we can copy it for the higher form symmetry. So a continuous one form symmetry, continuous Q form symmetry. can be spontaneously broken, whoops, can be spontaneously broken only in Q plus two dimension. And a discrete Q form symmetry can be spontaneously broken only in Q plus one dimension. And one way to think about it is that for the symmetry to be spontaneously broken, we must have to have a photon or a gauge field in the dimensions, in the low dimension, then there are no such fields, appropriate fields in the low dimensions. And we'll soon see examples of that. Yes. A can be spontaneously broken only in thank you for you one yeah but usually the answer is yes and symmetries might or might not be spontaneously broken. What you need to do is to condense the, the dual degrees of freedom. That, that's what the KT transition does. From the continuum point of view, there is nothing special at the KT point because the Lagrangian has both the momentum and the winding symmetries. There are no winding operators in the Lagrangian and therefore you just sail through the KT point. There's another theory where you break the winding symmetry by adding that thing, it's irrelevant on one side and relevant on the other side. And for the case of higher form symmetries, it's not easy to write down operators that violate the higher form symmetry. There are no, usually no high, local operators that violate the higher form symmetry. And therefore this cannot happen. However, there are often first order transitions where this thing happens. So I'm here, I'm just giving you some things that cannot happen. There are lots of things that can happen and I'm going to discuss that now. But first I gave these two statements about things that cannot happen. So let's discuss example one in more detail. Where is my magic wand? Sorry? I might have wrote, written the wrong thing. Q form symmetry, continuous Q form symmetry can be broken on above, uh, yeah, I did it. Does that solve your problem? Good, so what this thing demonstrates is my promise earlier that there would be more mistakes in the lecture and I'm happy to be vindicated. <laughs> and thank you, Lawrence. Since you're more advanced, you're not going to get points for <laughs> ah, actually it's correct in my notes. <clears throat> One thing I learned in all my years of giving talks, if there's a discrepancy between the notes and the blackboard, the notes are correct, the blackboard is wrong. So it's usually the form. So now we'll go through the various examples and we'll discuss example one first. So there are two U1 symmetries. I claim that both of them are spontaneously broken. So we have Goldstone theorem, which tells us that there is an operator. In this case, it's F nu nu. And there must be a state, which we call a photon, which has momentum P and polarization epsilon. And this thing is given by epsilon nu P nu minus epsilon nu P nu multiplied by e to the i px 
and this is at the point X. So this is what you know from Goldstone theorem. There is a current and the current is the interpolating field from one photon state to the vacuum. For Goldstone theorem, this is one, one Goldstone mode in the vacuum. And it's given by an expression like that that vanishes at zero momentum. So we interpret that to mean that both the electric and the magnetic symmetry, both for, for both of them, the current is F, both of them are spontaneously broken. And the photon is the Goldstone boson, both the Goldstone boson of the electric symmetry and the Goldstone boson of the magnetic symmetry. And now we'll play the trick that Mithat likes. We place the system on R3 cross S1. The one form symmetry splits into a zero form symmetry and a one form symmetry. The cast of characters so in four dimensions, we had two polarizations of the photon. So there were two propagating fields. Now I'm a three dimensional person, two plus one dimensional person for the condensed matter people in the audience. So we are in two plus one dimensions and there are still two modes. One of them can be interpreted as A4, the component of A around the circle that we compactify. And the other is the photon in three dimensions which can be dualized to a scalar. So we have two scalars and we can say that these two scalars correspond are the Goldstone bosons of the spontaneously broken symmetry. So that's what I wanted to say about example number one. Now we go to example number two and we know what the system does. It's a topological field theory. I claim that the ZN symmetry, one form symmetry, is again spontaneously broken. So, so if I find you can scalar these two one form symmetries, one is electric and the other one is magnetic, and they, they are spontaneously broken because I have this code. Yeah, that's in four dimensions. In four dimensions. So I prove that by looking at this equation. This equation tells me that if I act on the with the current, on the ground state, I produce the one Goldstone mode. So can you say that that's a property of the field that we have? That's correct. That's a very good way of saying it. The existence of the one form symmetry is a property of the theory and it falls under what I said, kinematics. And that's why I discussed it earlier. And now comes the dynamics. And this is what the theory does. That could change if we change the theory a little bit, as I would soon do. Well, you always do the same thing. What do you do is whenever confused with that high form symmetries, always go back to zero form symmetries. So there are many symmetries and they have all have currents. Imagine they're all continuous and you act with all of them on the vacuum and you find what you find. And depending on what you find, you say, if it annihilates the vacuum, symmetry is unbroken. If it does not annihilate the vacuum, it, it produces a, a Goldstone boson. So this, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. You could ask the same question about zero form symmetry. So the rule is when you have a question, first try to answer it for zero form symmetry. When you learn about Goldstone theorem in most field theory context, the first thing you learn is that for every broken generator, there's a massless Goldstone boson. Then when you study further, you realize that a Goldstone boson can do, be, can do double duty. The same Goldstone boson can be the Goldstone boson of more than one symmetry. So for example, if you have a domain wall, I don't know if uh, this was discussed by anybody here, but some people know more than I do. There's a domain wall and the domain wall can fluctuate. There's a massless mode, which tells us where the domain wall is in the transverse direction. These are Goldstone bosons, both of translation, translation perpendicular to the wall and of rotations. And the same Goldstone boson does double duty. It's both the Goldstone boson of one and the other. And you can write a whole group theory statement when, under what conditions, when the group G is broken to a group H, 
the number of gold, the number of goldstone bosons, there must be goldstone bosons, but it might be less than the number of broken generators. Yeah, well, from the point of view of the guy on the domain wall, the guy on the domain wall says, my world volume is two plus one dimension and anything that is there because my domain wall is embedded in a higher dimensional space, for me, it's an internal symmetry. So the group will not be the kind of standard group that you, in order to do that, the group cannot be the standard group that you find in, in normally in is internal symmetries in field theory, but this is very common. As an exercise, do the same thing for phonons. Do you know what phonons are? Good. How many phonons are there? Count how many phonons there are and how many symmetries are spontaneously broken and check that there are more goldstone bosons than broken symmetries. So this is something that you could say domain wall is a fancy idea of the people who dream, but phonons exist, you know, here. And it's the same thing. So going to discrete symmetry, so that was continuous. In example number two, the symmetry was discrete. We can't have a photon, but instead we have a discrete gauge field. So the fact that at low energies, we have a topological field theory is the statement that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Normally when a discrete symmetry is spontaneously broken, if we work at large and by finite volume, the system has a number of round states. Like in Ising model, all the spins are up or all the spins are down. The same thing is true here. If we study the system on compact space, strictly speaking, the symmetry is not spontaneously broken, but we have ground state degeneracy and we have Wilson lines that take us from one state to the other. And the fact that there's a non-trivial ground state degeneracy is the statement that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So that's true both in example two and in example three. Both of them, there is ground state degeneracy. And so if you put the system on a torus, I leave it as an exercise for you, put the system on a torus and count how many states there are. Let's be a little bit more interesting. So these were the free theories. Now we are moving to example four. Example four is more interesting because it's an interacting theory. It actually exists in nature in a superconductor. You can think of the superconductor as a U1 gauge field with a Cooper pair field, which has N equals two. So this is not just kind of an abstract thing. It actually exists in a nature. There is a U1 one cone symmetry and there is a Z2 electric symmetry. It's a little bit more complicated in the condensed matter application because there are also electrons around and the electrons have spin. But if you ignore all of them, what I said is completely right. What are the phases of this theory? Now, it is, since the theory is not free, we can vary the parameters. So, so we discussed number two, now we're discussing number three. What are the phases of the theory? So there's a scalar potential and the scalar potential could be such that the coefficient of phi square is positive or negative. What you're usually told is that when the phi coefficient of phi square is positive, the phi scalar is massive. We can forget about it. And the low energy theory is a U1 gauge theory. And the fact that there was a scalar field, we can forget about it. If mu square is negative, we roughly say that phi gets an expectation value. The more precise statement is that the U1 symmetry is Higgs. We have a Higgs mechanism and it breaks the gauge symmetry. What does it break the gauge symmetry to? What's the unbroken gauge symmetry? Zn, who said that? Good, thank you, Sal. So the symmetry is spontaneously broken to Zn and that connects to example number three. So let's do that in a little bit more detail. If M square is positive, means that the symmetry is not spontaneous, the Higgs does not condense. And then the electric symmetry and the magnetic symmetries are spontaneously broken. The electric 
and magnetic. So the electric was Zn and the magnetic was U1. The scalar is not there. The we have a massless photon and the symmetries are spontaneously broken. Since the magnetic is U1, it's spontaneously broken. So there must be a massless particle. And indeed there is a massless particle, that's the photon. Furthermore, if M is large, if the mass is large, I can forget about the scalar. And then I have an emergent one form symmetry, which is electric. So instead of having Zn electric symmetry, we have an emergent U1 electric symmetry. So that's what we have in the infrared, the spontaneously broken and we have a photon. M square negative is a little bit more interesting. The Higgs gets an expectation value. So the U1 gauge symmetry, as Sal told us, is spontaneously broken to, how did I denote it? Big N, spontaneously broken to Zn. And the spectrum is gapped. There are no massless particles. No, let's start with U1. The gauge group was U1. We started with the U1 gauge theory with scalars. Yeah. We'll soon do SU2, but. I so. guess I, I don't see now where this says N comma. N was the charge of the scalar field. So we have a scalar field of charge N. So say charge two for the Cooper pair. When it condenses, it breaks the U1 gauge symmetry to Z2. And the low energy observer says, all I see is a Z2 gauge theory. So the low energy observer sees, in this case, a ZN gauge theory. And we said that the ZN gauge theory has an electric and magnetic one form symmetry. So the low energy observer sees them. The electric one form symmetry is not shocking because it was there to begin with. It was an electric one form symmetry. It was spontaneously broken at short distances and it is spontaneously broken at long distances. But the magnetic symmetry is a little bit more interesting because we had a one form symmetry and it's clearly unbroken because the spectrum is gapped. Because as we said, if the symmetry is spontaneously broken, the symmetry is spontaneously broken, there must be a massless photon. So the magnetic symmetry is unbroken. So this is the first time in these lectures that we see a case where we have a one form symmetry and it's unbroken. And we said something about an unbroken one form symmetry before. When we are in four dimensions and we have a one form symmetry and it's unbroken, what should be the consequences? There's a physical consequence in the spectrum. Let me give you a clue. If a zero form symmetry is unbroken, the spectrum has particles or states which carry the charge. And if the one form symmetry is unbroken, the spectrum should have strings. So the first, just based on the symmetries, we see that the spectrum includes strings and these strings have a name. Sorry? Flux tubes, yeah, good. Is it the names of the people who discovered that? Flux line, okay. So there's a whole set of people, Nielsen Olsen string, Abrikosov strings, etc. Vortices, different names, but they are all follow from they all follow from the fact that the system has an exact symmetry. The symmetry is unbroken, and therefore the strings should better be there. Finally, we can move to the next example. What did I do? I know what I did. This was two and three, and this is number four. Surprise, nobody caught that. So this brings me to example five, the SUN gauge theory. And at short distances, 
the electric one form symmetry is spontaneously broken because we see the gluons. At long distances, we expect the spectrum to be gapped and there to be flux tubes, and they reflect the fact that the ZN one form symmetry is unbroken. And I already said before what happens if I compactify it on the circle. And as I do that, depending on the temperature, the symmetry splits to a zero form and a one form. And the zero form symmetry is either spontaneously broken or not, depending on whether the temperature is small or large. That word, this is backwards. It is backwards here. Yep. No. Actually, to be precise, there is no proof that if you have a zero form symmetry, at high temperature it's restored, or at high energies it's restored. And in many examples, this is the case, but I'm not aware of a proof that when you have a zero form symmetry, then at high energy, the symmetry is restored. And what happens here, and maybe that's why it's a little bit more subtle, that at high energy, the symmetry could be spontaneously broken and at low energies, it might be unbroken. And I think it would be nice to have an intuitive picture of why this is the case, but I'm not aware of one. I tried, I tried to, just as you said, I said it's the other way around, but. Uh, yep, that's what it is. Now, we don't know how to solve QCD. So the SUN gauge theory can also have other phases. What else can happen? So we should characterize everything by the symmetry. And the symmetry is a ZN one form symmetry. And we said that the symmetry is broken at high energies and is unbroken at low energies. But imagine somehow we have monopole condensation, the symmetry is broken, and T, which is a divisor of N, it remains unbroken. That would mean that the symmetry ZN could be spontaneously broken to a ZT subgroup. So at, at high energy, the entire ZN is spontaneously broken. At low energies, the ZN is slightly broken, but the ZT subgroup of it is unbroken. So we can have phenomena like that. And in that case, what we have at low energies is still a spontaneously broken discrete symmetry, which is realized as a gauge theory. So this is not a very hypothetical situation. You can actually construct Lagrangians that exhibit exactly this phenomenon. So you start with SUN gauge theory with some Higgs and some potent with some potential. And some the weak coupling, the SUN gauge symmetry is Higgs to something. Then the strong coupling at that theory confines, but we are left behind with an unbroken, uh, with a spontaneously broken uh, discrete symmetry, which is realized at low energies is a gauge theory, ZN gauge theory. We already discussed example six. We're going through the examples there, number six. There is no one form symmetry and therefore there isn't much to discuss. For better or for worse, this is what we have in nature, QCD with quarks. And there is no precise notion of confinement unless we find a way to suppress the quarks, either by doing large N, or by sending, making the quarks heavy. Question. Ah, we'll soon get to SPTs. The quick answer is yes. But even if this ZN is unbroken, there could still be unbroken ZN with SPT, with very interesting edge modes. Sorry? Uh, that would be an example, but uh, there are others.
Okay, so we discussed that. Now we move to number five, number seven. Number seven is a PSUN gauge theory. And now we cannot discuss center symmetry. However, because there's no center. However, we do have a one form symmetry. We have a magnetic one form symmetry. And the order parameter is the Atuft loop. So in vacua, where monopole condense, the uh, Atuft loop has a perimeter law. And in vacua, where dions condense, the behavior of the, Wils of the Atuft loop could be more complicated, depending on the charge of the condensing, the electric charge of the condensing dion. And when I say electric charge, I mean the anality of the charge of that particle. So for lack of time, I'm not going to discuss it in detail. Let me just say that there are different phases depending on an integer P, which is roughly the electric charge up to N minus one of the condensing monopole. And what that means is that H has area law. But H to the T with T is N over the GCD of P and N has a perimeter law. Which means that the symmetry is spontaneous. They are T, uh, there's a ZT gauge theory at low energies. So the low energy theory has topological order associated with Z of that. And again, this is something that we can find easily to write down Lagrangians that do the job. The simplest one is SO3 gauge theory. SO3 is an example of that with N equals one supersymmetry. If the gauge group is SU2, there are two vacua and Witten described it briefly here, and you will hear more next week. There are two vacua and one of them in a monopole condenses and the other a dion condenses. In SU2, there's really a symmetry between them, but if the gauge group is SO3, there is no symmetry between them. And indeed in one of the vacua, the vacuum is completely trivial. In the other case, when the dion condenses, there's an unbroken Z2 gauge theory at that point. So, I said some things which are a little bit more advanced so that you can see that such things do exist. And this brings me to my favorite example, which I don't know where I wrote it. It was number eight. Maybe it's buried somewhere. Ah, the one with the mistake. So number eight, So what can happen? There's an SUN plus one global symmetry, actually PSUN N plus one global symmetry. And if we are at weak coupling and we are in high dimensions, say two, three dimensions, then the symmetry is spontaneously broken and the CPN's nonlinear sigma model describes the breaking of SUN plus one to SUN and the target space is CPN. So if we are high enough dimension, this is what happens. The, we would say that this is the broken phase because the global symmetry is spontaneously broken. The condensed matter people would say this is an ordered phase because all the spins are oriented and are ordered in the same direction. In this case, as we said, there is a higher form symmetry. If we are in four dimensions, the higher form symmetry is a one form symmetry. And there are strings, they are massive strings, strings that come from wrapping the target space, cropping two dimensions of space on the target space. And we discussed it a little bit yesterday. And again, today in two plus one dimensions, this is a zero form symmetry and the charge objects are particles known as skirmions. In three plus one dimensions, these are strings. But now comes the surprise. This model in three plus one dimensions is not renormalizable. So what I really mean by that is I have to UV complete it. I have to put it on the lattice or something. Okay, so let's take this model and put it on the lattice. That's completely straightforward on every site 
We put a spin that lives on this manifold and there are some nearest neighbor interactions. And that's a lot easier than the lattice models that you discussed in these lectures. And now let's tune the parameters on the, on the lattice. We can write all sorts of parameters and try and go to a disordered phase where these spins fluctuate rapidly. In the high energy language, this is a statement that we can go to the unbroken phase. So at weak coupling, we were in the broken phase. The symmetry was spontaneously broken. We had Goldstone bosons and we saw the target space, but we can tune the parameters and find another phase where the spins fluctuate rapidly. It's strong coupling. And so in phase one, say, let me write it unbroken, broken phase is spontaneously broken, but in the unbroken phase, also known as the disordered phase, phase, the PSUN plus one is unbroken. So the zero form symmetry is unbroken. What about the one form symmetry? The one form symmetry might or might not be spontaneously broken, but it could be spontaneously broken. So the higher form symmetry might be spontaneously broken. That's actually very easy to arrange on the lattice. So if we are in a three plus one D, there's a one form symmetry. And the one form symmetry might be broken. So if we arrange the parameters such that if it is broken, it is broken. What should be the signature of that in the spectrum? It's a continuous U1 symmetry, one form symmetry. U1, one form symmetry. So we have a continuous one form symmetry. If it's spontaneously broken, what do we know about the spectrum? Sorry? Photon. So this model can manufacture a photon. So even though with short distances, there was no photon, all we had was scalars of spins on the lattice. At long distances, we can find a massless photon. Now, this result is very well known in two dimension. The CPN model in two dimension has an emergent photon, but you could say that in two dimensions, the emergent photon is a fake because there isn't really a photon in two dimensions. It's almost the case in three plus one dimension, but the particle that you get, the photon becomes a massless scalar field. So you say, okay, that's not a big deal. But if you do the same thing in three plus one dimension, you get a gauge field out of nothing. And it's unambiguously a gauge field because you can do duality all, way, all day but it remains a gauge field. Now it's true that the one form symmetry is a center symmetry for this emergent photon, but it's not a center symmetry microscopically. So we talked about the same thing before in reverse, and now we see it here. The conceptual reason there is a massless photon is that we have a one form symmetry and it is spontaneously broken. Now, the same model can also appear in reverse. We can have a gauge theory at short distances, which has a center symmetry. And then at long distances, we can find this phase, the broken phase without gauge fields. And then the one form symmetry, which is unbroken, is realized at, short distance, at long distances, but through the topology of the target space. And I mentioned that yesterday. For lack of time, I'm going to, and with your permission, I'll skip the SPT phases because. Yeah. So in dimensions less than three plus one, the CPM model is as scalar as you. Well, the, in dimensions less than three plus one, so two plus one, it, in, in one plus one, it's the well studied model. The zero form symmetry is unbroken. There is a one form symmetry, but it's kind of boring. And 
that's a standard CPN that you know and love. In two plus one, it has two different phases. The ordered phase has the Goldstone bosons of, has the Goldstone boson of the, that the, that the target manifold is the CPN model. And the one form symmetry is unbroken and correspondingly there are strings. By tuning, so but this model on its own doesn't make sense. It needs a UV completion. If you put it on the lattice, you can vary the parameters on the lattice and go to an ordered phase, a disordered phase where the symmetry is unbroken. But then the one form symmetry is spontaneously broken and the spontaneously broken one form symmetry manifests itself as a massless photon at long distances. But it is interesting that you get a massless photon and it's unambiguously a photon because we are in three plus one dimension, right? This is a partic massless particle with spin one with two polarizations, even though microscopically there was no gauge symmetry to talk about. So the gauge, the, gauge, the, the photon is completely emergent. So somebody asked me why I think that gauge symmetry is not fundamental. This is a very clear example. In all the other, there is a gauge symmetry and you dualize and you find another gauge symmetry. It will say, okay, one of them is fundamental. The other is not. Here, it hits you in the face. There is no gauge field to begin with and you manufacture a gauge field at long distances. Yeah. How many dimensions? Yes. Sort of. Yes. Okay, I, the, I, I can ask you an easier question. Just take the U1 gauge theory in one plus one dimension. The, if you put charges, there's a linear potential. So I would say that the symmetry is unbroken. There's nothing massless. That's why it's cleaner. You see, in low dimensions, it's too crowded, literally. And you don't have a photon. But this example is very clean. I do it in four dimensions. Okay, I'll make it more dramatic. On the lattice, I can put it in seven dimensions. I'll put go very high dimension on the lattice. Do this, put the same spin system on the lattice in high dimension. And then I'll find massless gauge fields at low energies. We'll have higher spin. And they're protected to be exactly massless because of the higher form symmetry. In how many dimensions? I would say yes. No, no scalar, it's, a, it's just a photon. It, write F mu nu square in one plus one. You can write it. Forget the scalar field, just write F mu nu square in one plus one. You could ask his question there. F mu nu square in one plus one. The symmetry is unbroken. Do you know, uh, is it actually possible to disorder? I think so. Bartle Schwinger model is a different model because we have the matter fields and we don't have the electric symmetry. We, we can change the model all day. We can consider just the pure gauge theory. Then we can add scalar field with charge one, then there's no one form symmetry. Or we could add scalar fields with charge n, and then there's a Zn symmetry. And, but if you just look at the beginning of the lecture, this electric one form symmetry could not be spontaneously broken anyway. Right, because in one plus one dimension by the standard rules that I had and Lawrence corrected me. Right, so in one plus one dimension, the one form symmetry, continuous one form symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken. Just as a zero form symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken. In the remaining time, and I'd be happy to talk to Saul later about SPT phases. There are SPT phases of, so for those people who know what SPT phases are, I would just say that there are SPT phases of higher form symmetries and correspondingly there are edge modes. And if there are domain walls, there are modes on the domain walls. Some of them had been predicted before. 
but since I talked about symmetries, and this is a topic that is close to my heart for many years, I'm not going to say how many of working on it. I thought I should summarize my understanding in a little table, which I've said through the talks and in the discussion, bits and pieces of it. But since it's important, I would like to summarize it in a table. And various comments that I made during the lectures or in private will find their place here in the table. So here I'll put the global symmetry, It'd be zero form, one form, whatever. And here I'll put the local symmetry, also known as gauge, and imprecisely called symmetry also. The global symmetry is an intrinsic property of the theory. When we can formulate the same theory in many different ways using different degrees of freedom, this is known as duality. We can formulate the, the presentation. The global symmetry is an intrinsic property of the theory. It exists, it's unambiguous, it is characterized by operators that have their own correlation functions. The gauge symmetry is ambiguous. The gauge symmetry is ambiguous. And we talked about duality, which allows us to give two different presentations with different gauge symmetries. Now, the global symmetry could be accidental. Approximate. Or emergent. slash accidental. The high energy terminology is accidental. The condensed matter terminology is emergent. The gauge symmetry can emerge in the IR. See this example. But once it does, it is exact unlike the symmetries here. I should add parenthetically that when we have an emergent higher form symmetry, it's also exact in the sense that no local operators can violate it. But if we perform experiments at higher energies, we will see that the symmetry is approximate. Whereas that's not the case with gauge symmetry. It's not the case because the gauge symmetry is not really a symmetry and therefore there's no sense in which it can be approximate. It's not, so there are two different meanings of approximate symmetries. One is what you said. There's a parameter at short distances. We can turn it off. Then we have a symmetry at short distances. That's the model we study. And then we have the symmetry at long distances. And then you deform the UV and correspondingly you deform the IR and the symmetry is approximate. That's what you said. There's another possibility that the low energy theory has a brand new symmetry, which has nothing to do with anything in the UV like B minus L in the standard model. The standard model of particle physics has B minus L symmetry. Nobody thinks that this is an exact symmetry of nature. And the reason it exists at low energies is that all the operators in the standard, all the relevant marginal and relevant operators of the standard model happen to preserve that symmetry. So there's no deep reason why it's there. And hence the name accidental, it's an accident that it is there. There are many other examples of that in the XY model, the C equals one model, depending on where you came from, for sufficiently large radius of the compact boson. The winding symmetry, you don't have to impose it microscopically. It appears as a macro, at long distances as an emergent symmetry. And again, it is only approximate. Uh, that's right. There's also barrier number. Yeah. 
it's pretty exact, but not exact. Pe no, people do experiments. <laughs> Okay. So there are other symmetries that go long, much longer than that. So Netter's theorem goes longer than that, older than that. And when lattices of symmetries were classified by Brevet, it was even longer, older than that. So, and I don't know, and as I gave the example of the Taj Mahal the other day, it was built with its symmetry, even older than that. We can go back in history and find lots of examples. So what do we do with symmetries? We can use it to classify operators. Here, all the operators are invariant. And indeed, that's not really a symmetry. because all the operators are invariant under the symmetry. So that's the UV. In the IR, the symmetry might or might not be spontaneously broken. So it can be spontaneously broken. Here, since it's not really a symmetry, it cannot be spontaneously broken. Now, when you study the Higgs mechanism, you study the Higgs mechanism as spontaneously breaking the, the gauge symmetry. And this is quite good at weak coupling, but that's not precise because there is no notion of Higgs phenomenon at strong coupling. In which aspect, the fact that it can, the Higgs mechanism, the way it's usually taught in school, is that you first make believe that the gauge symmetry was not there. It was a global symmetry. It was spontaneously broken. There is a Goldstone boson. Then you turn on the gauge field with a small coefficient. So it can't change the fact that the, the potential had its form and the Higgs field had a wave. And then you say, ah, what happened to the Goldstone boson? It's eaten by the gauge field and becomes massive. This is a correct description at weak coupling. But if the coupling is strong, this description cannot possibly be correct because you cannot describe it in terms of gauge invariant quantities. What you can describe in, in terms of gauge invariant quantity is the symmetries, the global symmetries. And depending on the charge of the Higgs field, there might not be a global symmetry at all. So if the Higgs field has charge one, there is no global symmetry. And there's nothing to be broken or unbroken. If there's charge two, there is a Z2 one form symmetry and it might or might not be spontaneously broken. So for the case of charge one, what this means is that there is no invariant distinction between the Higgs phase and the confining phase. And this statement has a very long history from many different perspectives. At weak coupling, there's something that looks very much like the Higgs mechanism. That's like the weak interaction in the standard model. It, in, a, in the coupling of the standard model, it looks very much like QCD is spontaneous, is, is confining rather than being Higgs. But if you view the system more broadly and you change the parameters in the continuous way, the weak interactions could become confining and QCD could become Higgs and there will not be any phase transition between them. It's kind of tricky because it should be easier for you because you, were heard, you heard the correct statement with you're under 30. I heard the correct statement, I was older. <laughs> but we were all educated incorrectly. And what can I say? I think that what I just said is the correct statement. The only invariant thing is the higher form symmetry, which is or is not spontaneously broken. And that's the modern way of saying things which were already understood in the late 70s. In the late 70s, it was already understood that in the case of the weak interactions of QCD, there isn't really a distinction between Higgs and confinement. So I'm talking late 70s, as David Gross, I think, said, before your parents were born. Borderline. 
So that was understood then. The proper way to say that is in terms of higher form symmetry. That's an intrinsic property of the theory. <clears throat> so it can be spontaneously broken. Now, if, if it is unbroken, broken, we can classify states. The symmetry is unbroken, we can classify states. Well, this whole thing doesn't mean anything if it's broken or not, the states are gauge invariant anyway. So there's no analogous entry in the table here. Similarly, we can ask, is it broken or unbroken? We can classify phases. And we talked about the Landau paradigm. Talked about the Landau paradigm to classify phases. So originally it was done for zero form symmetries. Then it was extended to higher form symmetries. And what was previously considered going outside the Landau paradigm was incorporated in the Landau paradigm as a, from a more modern perspective. And more recently, this was extended further to what is known as non-invertible symmetries. And they also have other names. And presumably all the phases can be incorporated into the Landau paradigm by extending what we mean by a symmetry. So it's useful in, to characterize phases. And we can't say that here because this gauge symmetry doesn't mean anything. Now, the, I've discussed it only in the first lecture. There could be truth anomalies. So in the first lecture, I discussed it in, in, the, in the context of quantum mechanics. The, my original plan for these lectures was to discuss truth anomalies in higher dimensions. But the school principal told me that I should talk about this stuff. So I changed it. But it is still true that there can be truth anomalies. In the other side, there cannot be anomalies. So when people say that the anomalies mean that the theory is inconsistent, what they're talking about is this column, not that one. Gauge symmetries cannot be anomalous. Global symmetries are actually typically anomalous, and that does not signal an inconsistency of the theory, as I emphasized in the two examples in the first lecture. If we are more sophisticated and we are interested in gravity, we say that there are no global symmetries in gravity. So in a way, this whole discussion about global symmetries from the point of view of globe or fundamental physics doesn't mean much because this is not a symmetry of nature because every symmetry will eventually be broken at high enough energies because there are no global symmetries in, in gravity. However, they're still very powerful tools. We have approximate symmetries in nature. We could use them to analyze models and to solve them. And that's why it's so important to discuss it. As I said at the beginning of my first lectures, symmetries are never essential. If you solve the model, you don't need the symmetry. You have the exact solution, end of story. You know everything about the model. But in most cases, you can't solve exactly, and you can get a very quick answer just by knowing the symmetries. Now, what about the gauge symmetries? Here, they appear to be essential To give a description of the standard model. And also in gravity, gravity has its own gauge symmetry, which is coordinate transformation. On the other hand, I argue that it's kind of ambiguous. You can change coordinates, you can change fields, you can use another duality frame and the gauge symmetry is different. And probably the final formulation of the theory of the universe, there will be no global symmetry because there can't be any. There will not be any gauge symmetry because they don't mean anything. 
and everything will be emergent. How that will be done, that will probably be in the next PITP. Actually, the one after next, the next one will be a condensed matter physics. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop here. Thanks, great job, principal says. No, no quantities. But there's the charge which is conserved. So would your answer be that that charge is related to this? So yeah. So the if you want, you can formulate all of QED in a very awkward but gauge invariant way, and then you will not be confused. But you have to work much harder. The electron on its own does not make sense because it's not gauge invariant. But the electron can be attached to a Wilson line. If you are in compact space, the Wilson line will have to go somewhere perhaps to a positron somewhere else. If you're in a non-compact space, Wilson line can go to infinity. And then you can measure the total charge by computing a surface around it. So if the theory is weakly coupled, what I just said is completely right. And there's an approximate notion of charge conservation. If the theory is strongly coupled, then it starts getting tricky. And so, for example, in QCD, can you describe the charge? And so QCD also confined, but imagine it didn't confine for whatever reason. Like it has lots of massless particles, so it's a, it flows to an infrared free theory. It would be very tricky to define the color of the states because they kind of constantly change. But the main point is that you don't have to. So there are many things that are being taught about QED, et cetera, which are true if the system is weakly coupled. And they're usually applied to systems that are weakly coupled, the Higgs mechanism, charge conservation, et cetera. But if the system is strongly coupled and you won't work precisely, you have to go back and question what you were taught. So for example, if space is compact, so imagine, we live on the torus or on the sphere, then the total charge has to vanish. And the total charge in a given region is not conserved because the particles can move around. So when you discuss charge, charge conservation, what you, see, what you really had in mind is the total charge measured at infinity, right? You go to infinity, you assume the fact, you use the fact that we live in non-compact space, we go at infinity and you, me you measure the total charge in the system. Now, in practice, that's not what you do. And we don't care whether the universe is compact or not because it's very far. And you could say you have a box and you count the number of electrons in the box and modulo the negligible process that an electron hopped outside, which can happen, you can measure the total charge. Okay. Uh, Mita. Um, but yeah. And, and, yeah. I, I want to sharpen my question. I totally agree with you on Maxwell theory. There is a one form symmetry in one plus one and it's unbroken. But when we go to CPN, there are also scalars there, right? And they require charge as well under that emergent symmetry. How, ma how many? Do one plus one. We do not have we do not have one form symmetry in bosonic CPN. It is in the sense of symmetries. No, in, in the bosonic know. CPN, you indeed don't have it. Yeah, I agree with that. In the bosonic CPN, what you have is this model is completely solvable. There is a PSUN plus one, as Lawrence corrected me, global symmetry. It's a zero form symmetry, and that's all there is. And the spectrum includes a particle in the fundamental of that. But, but uh, if you look to the potential between, uh, this is the, all there is a linear growing potential, but according to your criteria, we should call this. But it, okay, let's first discuss what the symmetry is. In one plus one dimensions, there is no higher form symmetry in this theory. It, even if you formulate it in terms of gauge field, 
there are n plus one scalars and there is a U1 gauge field. Naively, the U1 gauge field has a one form symmetry, but the presence of the scalar field explicitly kills it. So in one plus one dimensions, there is no one form symmetry. If you go up, if you go up, let, if, let me connect that to what I said. If you go up to two plus one dimension, you still describe it using n plus one Zs and a photon. And the photon has a magnetic one form symmetry, not electric. The symmetry that I talked about is the magnetic symmetry of that U1 gauge field. And as you go higher up in dimension, the, the form, what form it is, keeps growing with the dimension. My objection is that we know that from the larger solution, there is a linearly growing potential between two sources here. But this classification calls it called confinement, not, not a property of this theory. That's my objection. Okay, which are you talking about CPN in one plus one? CPS, CPN one plus one. Okay, CPN okay. one plus one, there is no growing potential. You can pair create and screen it. But there is still- At, at <laughs> infinite n, yeah, at infinite n, you're right. As I said before, at infinite n, the charge matter, you can forget about it. And then there's a one form electric symmetry. We're discussing about the electric, there's no magnetic symmetry in one plus one. We're talking about the electric symmetry. At infinite n, there's an electric symmetry, sort of. Where is the guy from Minnesota? <laughs> there he is, yes. So he's the expert on that. At infinite n, you can get a new one a electric symmetry. But at finite n, finite but large, n is a billion, but not too large. Then uh, n is large, and the one form symmetry is not exact. And indeed, you get a linear potential, but then you can pop two z's out of the vacuum and they screen it. Okay, can yeah. I interject? Uh, we have a whole hour <laughs> of uh, Q and A, so maybe we continue there. And uh, thanks, Nati, again. Thank you.